I've been with the Zamboni company for 36 years. And as a celebration for me, uh, they threw a hurricane that turned into a tropical storm that uh, we got to experience this weekend. And along with that, the same day we had a hurricane. So that was our excitement for this weekend. Um, I came to the company from uh, Minnesota where I worked for my father a long time ago. And I've been uh, dealing with uh, our machines and selling them uh, for the last 36 years. So that's a little bit of history about myself. We can go on to slide two, please. This is um, the history of Zamboni and its electric machines. Um, the first Zamboni electric machine that uh, was built was used at the 1960 Olympic Games in Squaw Valley. Uh, for those of you who aren't old enough to remember that, that was the first miracle on ice that took place where the USA won their first gold medal in Olympic men's hockey. Uh, in the 1970s, the 550 was developed and that was developed primarily for uh, ice capade chalets for mall rink applications. Uh, the one on this picture, I believe, is from Edmonton, um, but it was used uh, primarily in mall rinks. It didn't have a lot of runtime, um, did its job pretty well for the time that uh, uh, it was developed, um, but nothing like what the machines are today that you see. Uh, in 1990, the Zamboni 552 was introduced. It's hard to believe that it's been 33 years uh, since that was first introduced. It's been used at multiple Olympic Games. And it was the first electric machine, production electric machine, that was capable of handling uh, indoor um, busy rinks. Uh, in 2010, uh, the 560 came out, and this was a change to a slightly more automated machine with the ability to have a one-touch operation along with uh, using AC motors for the first time. Uh, in 2015, the 650 came out, and that was the machine that's on the left-hand side, uh, the third slide. That one is uh, one that uh, was developed to provide people with a different look, um, something to change up from the traditional boxy look that the uh, standard Zamboni machines have. In 2017, the 552 made a big change going to AC motors from DC. And what this allowed us to do is give customers a more efficient machine, along with a machine that required less maintenance. Um, don't have to change the brushes out as it's a brushless motor. The 450 came along in 2018, and that was the first manufactured LI battery machine. And that's taken off very well. It's been very popular in the Canadian marketplace in that it uh, has a slightly tighter turning radius for the rinks up there where a lot of the older rinks are more 185 by 85 instead of the 200 uh, by 85 that's standard NHL size down here in the States. And then the 552 in 2019 um, became available in LI. And we are at a point right now where about 90% of the purchasers of, L of 552 machines are going with the LI. Go on to the, the next slide, Liz. I'm working on it. Okay. The, the next one goes, we've got uh, on the top right, with you can see the arrow pointing to the GE controls. We had two boxes that uh, were part of the controls on the early 552s. And that is um, something that uh, we were able to go away with several years later to the Subcon. You can see that on the bottom left and much cleaner, much smaller um, real estate required. Uh, to house all of that. It's in one box that is underneath the operator seat. So again, more efficiency, less components, less wear items. Um, and if you're still running with a GE machine, it might be time to consider stepping up uh, and getting a newer machine. On to the next slide. We're going to take a look at this. How many people out there remember what this is or maybe have one of these? This is the number one problem that we've experienced with people and customers um, in the life of the 552 and that they have not taken proper care of their batteries. This sheet on the left-hand side that is the, where you're supposed to record your information for specific gravity and open circuit voltage, that's supposed to be being done once a week. Now, a lot of times people don't do that and 
that leads to problems um, where they're not keeping track of what's going on with their batteries. The batteries don't go from good to bad overnight. It's a gradual transition. And if you're doing what you're supposed to be doing by charting your battery information, keeping track of the specific gravity and the open circuit voltage, then you're gonna have an idea as to what's going on with your battery pack. The open circuit voltage is measured with a multimeter and that's something that should be done on all 40 cells um, every week. And the specific gravity is done with the multimeter, I'm sorry, with a hydrometer. And that should be doing one uh, row per tray. And there's two trays with 20 cells of batteries uh, in each tray. And you should be doing one row per week in each of the trays so that over the course of the month, you've sampled all 40 cells with the specific gravity. If you don't have this and you've got a lead acid uh, machine, lead acid battery machine, you need to be getting a copy of this and start that process. It's never too late to start. And it is something that uh, with uh, regards to warranty that you're gonna need to have that information. That's gonna be the first thing that the battery supplier is going to um, ask you for. We'll go on to the next slide, Liz. Um, what we're talking about here is the different options that we've got for sustainability. And we'll get into those um, in a, a little bit um, to each one of them. So on to the next slide and what we've got um, in now available in lithium ion, as we mentioned earlier, we've got the 650 that just recently became available with the ion, lithium ion, the 450 and the 552 has been out since about 2019. We'll go on to the next one. This shows the 552 with the lithium ion battery pack, slightly smaller than uh, the space consumed by a lead acid battery. It's a sealed battery package. Um, it is something that I've pushed really hard for people to go to this because it completely eliminates um, what you have to do as far as maintenance wise. You no longer have to measure specific gravity. You no longer have to measure open circuit voltage. All that you really need to do is remember to plug it in and charge it up. And the best practice with a lithium ion battery is plug it in after each and every resurface, go back out, reuse the um, machine, and then come back in and plug it back in. It's so simple that even Doug can figure out how to deal with this when we're operating a machine. So uh, a much cleaner look to the machine uh, and it's a lot um, easier for the operators to have to deal with. Some of the benefits um, about it include no corrosion risk due to overwatering. I can tell you that I've been into facilities where um, I take a look at uh, the floor underneath where the machine is and if there is a large rust ring around uh, around the concrete underneath where the machine is parked that's a typical sign that the batteries have been overwatered and that they um, have overflowed and it's going to cause you problems in that you diluted the acid mixture in the battery and it also is uh, something that's going to lead to corrosion on the machine so by going to a lithium ion battery, you are eliminating uh, the potential for that to happen. It's ideally suited for the rink industry use. Um, maybe not so much in the forklift world because they're looking for something that's going to uh, be able to um, run for eight hours without um, needing a charge. But for us, our machines are typically operated for a 10 to 15 minute cycle. Uh, sometimes a little bit longer than that when people are doing ice maintenance if they have to do that. Um, but for the most part, a typical resurfacing is going to be 10 to 15 minutes and then you'll be able to plug it in and charge it up. And our suppliers are telling us that it's a one to one ratio. I like to be a little bit more cautious and tell people that it's about a one and a half uh, um, ratio so that if you run it for 10 minutes, it takes about 15 minutes to fill the tank back up with the energy that you consumed in that uh, um, resurfacing. Zero maintenance, again, you don't have to water the batteries, you don't have to test them. This saves on uh, labor and time for the operators to be able to do more things around the rink. 
it's got uh, a BMS system, and that stands for battery, battery monitoring system. And what that's doing is that there's a series of wires that are connected from the battery to the charger. The charger and the battery are talking to each other, and the battery is telling the charger what it needs, and the charger is saying, okay, I'm going to give this to you and um, bring it back to where you need to be. Uh, we're expecting a much longer life out of the lithium ion batteries in part because we don't have to depend on people properly taking care of the batteries other than charging. Um, so it's something that we're hopeful that we're gonna see north of 10 years on a lithium ion battery. Um, reduced cost of ownership. It is more expensive to go with a lithium ion battery up front, but it's gonna cost you less over the life because you're not investing the labor uh, time that's needed to maintain a lead acid. Lithium ion is a green choice along with any electric machine. Um, fuel savings from a uh, fuel powered machine, if you've never made the switch from a fuel powered machine to an electric, uh, we're talking about a minimal cost to charge up a machine. Um, a typical fuel cost uh, is been probably about a dollar of resurfacing and that was back when fuel prices weren't as high as they are. And then the number one thing that electrics offer and why we originally came out with them in 1990 is the concerns about air quality. And when I was a kid growing up in Minnesota uh, playing hockey, we had chain link fence instead of acrylic uh, or tempered glass to create a fishbowl effect. And um, as exhaust emissions are heavier than air, they're gonna seek out the cold surface of the ice surface. And that's generally why the younger folks are impacted because they're closer to the ground than adults are when they're playing. Um, Minnesota has got one of the strictest sets of air standards in the industry. And for that reason, most of the rinks back there, I think we're probably at about 60, 65% of the rinks back there are using our electric machine. Um, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Michigan are other states that have uh, standards that are very, um, very good in uh, requiring people to make sure that they're monitoring what's going on in their rink. I don't have 20 years left in this industry. I don't know if it'll take 20 years um, before we get to the point where everybody is using an electric machine, but I can envision based on how far we've come in 33 years since the 552 first came out that people will be using only electric machines at some point in time in the future. So we'll go on to the next slide, please. I'm gonna talk a little bit about fast ice. And what fast ice is, is a computerized water delivery system for your ice making water. This is a system that Zamboni acquired from a company who they thought they could get by with uh, selling it to NHL buildings and maybe some minor league buildings, uh, and that would be sufficient for them, but it didn't turn out that way. Um, we've taken this system on and we feel we've enhanced it, um, made it better, made it easier for people to get it on and off their machine, which um, helps in making it easier for them to change the blade. Um, but it is something that uh, we're starting to get a lot of traction in it in community rinks, um, in addition to just about every NHL building that we're selling machine to these days is going with this system. We'll go on to the next slide. This, what, what Fast Ice is doing is it's putting it down in a spray and by spraying the water down, instead of putting it down with a regular traditional towel flood, it's going to hit the ice and it's going to freeze faster. And what this is going to do is allow the ice to become harder and denser. Um, less gases are going to get trapped in it. Um, and it also enables you to build the ice faster. Um, it really is something that uh, is improving the ice quality in rinks that are going with this option. This is the onboard display. What this is allowing you to do is to have a more precise control of how much water um, that you're putting down. It's going to um, 
give you how much water you've got on the left-hand side, lower quadrant. It will tell you how much water you've got in the machine. It can tell you how many gallons that you put down um, on the ice surface. It can tell you how fast you're going in miles per hour, which is something that we try to get people to maintain a five mile an hour speed. And we've had comments uh, from customers who've got this system that said that it allows their operators to be more consistent uh, in the speed. If you take a look at the top left quadrant where it says scaling, um, you'll see that that's something that the pod on the right hand side of the unit adjusts and you can adjust up and down how much water that you want going down. The right hand quadrants um, basically are used only for telling you how much pressure is coming out and what the water flow is. And those are just there if there's a problem with the system, um, you wouldn't be getting readings or proper readings. The thermometer bulb there, that's gonna tell you what the temperature of the water is um, that's going out. And with this system, it is um, important that uh, hot water is used. It needs to be north of 105 degrees. Top right uh, rocker switches allow the operator to turn on and off the boom, um, either the upper boom or the lower boom. And if an operator is resurfacing the ice the way they should be doing, they're going to be um, turning the water off when they're going through the crease area, whether they're dealing it with a towel flood or whether they're doing it with uh, a fast ice system. With the fast ice system, this gives the operator the ability to be more precise in getting the water turned off. And with this, you can turn off the upper boom, which has got more flow to it than the lower boom. And this will allow you to um, still put a little bit of water down, which is what you're gonna need to do with this because it's a spray. Whereas with a towel flood, there's usually enough water left in the towel as you're making your turn. And it's real important. A lot of times people don't understand why we recommend that you turn off the water. The reason being is that you're going over the same area time and time again through the resurfacing process. And if you don't turn the water off, you're softening up that surface. And uh, that's what leads to people shaving up their creases or having low spots in the crease because they're not turning up the blade and they're not turning off the water. Pretty simple system, it might look complicated, but um, it's really easy for the operator um, to get to use this. It's also got a board blast that is on it, which allows the operator to flick the bottom uh, left button, I believe that it is. And um, that allows you to spray water up against the boards through a steady stream. Um, you could use that if you've edged the ice and you've got a ridge against the, uh, the kick plate between the kick plate and the ice, you could put that on there and um, that will knock that down. It's also got the ability to, on the bottom right-hand side uh, of the switches, um, to hit a blast, which will give you the ability to put down more, the, the full flow of water, um, no matter what you've got it set at. So let's say you've got a low spot and you want to put more water down in that area by pushing that button, that'll give you 10 seconds of water um, being applied at full, full force. I'm going to go on to the, the next slide that's going to talk a little bit about level ice and level ice what this is is it's a laser control for the machine and its blade um, so that it reduces one more thing that the operator has to worry about uh, there's a laser that gets mounted within the facility uh, and if you take a look at the there's a black cord there going up to the receiver um, the receiver's on the machine and uh, you set your ice, desired ice thickness by doing a benchmark process, and then the laser takes over and it controls the blade and it adjusts the blade up or down uh, as to um, what the ice thickness needs it to do. One of our board members um, who purchased a new machine a few years back, and it's probably closer to five years back now, um, has told us that they're saving uh, over $10,000 a year in um, expenses that they incurred in labor uh, when they're dealing with um, a non-lasered machine. And it uh, basically um, controls the ice shaving for the operator so that if they are not remembering what to do, um, it's gonna do it for them. 
it's less for the operator to have to worry about. It's easy to use if you're wanting to change textile um, logos. Uh, this is one of the things that I had a customer uh, from an NHL building says that he loves it the best is that it enables him and they probably change um, logos more so than a community rink would, but uh, it enables him to be able to go over that spot and get to right above the logo so that he doesn't damage the logo, hit it with some hot water and pull it out and makes it real easy. Same thing goes if you're ever to cover up the ice, let's say you um, wanted to do a, a pink for uh, breast cancer awareness, if you wanted to do green for um, St. Patrick's Day, this would enable you to get back down to your normal ice thickness um, rather quickly and get uh, rid of the surface that you wanted to shave off. Um, it's, it, it provides you with some energy savings in that you're going to be able to more accurately control your ice thickness. Um, this gets you maybe some additional accuracy in what your ice surface is going to be so that uh, you're not dependent on an operator uh, going out with a drill. You can drive around with this machine with the onboard computer. It's going to be able to tell you where your ice thickness is at. And then the biggest thing is, is that the blade is adjusting. The operator no longer has to um, crank the blade up or down. The laser will do that for them. Uh, this is something that we do send out, if there is a problem, they get a blade wheel so that you're able to go back to manual mode if you needed to. But um, this has been a pretty reliable system other than if an operator um, doesn't wait for the laser to come down when they're exiting the ice and they catch it on a, on a net. So on to the next slide. Um, this is one of the things with the laser ice. They statement of reduced water consumption. And I believe what this is talking about is that by maintaining a more level surface of ice, um, you're not gonna be building up your ice surface and then having to take it back down doing ice maintenance. Um, so that translates to reduced ice maintenance, also reduced load on your compressors. Go on to the next slide. Going to talk about Zamboni Connect. I'm not sure how many people have this. This is a feature that is a hardware and software uh, based application. It's something that you need to have Wi Fi in your building, preferably in your resurfacer room. Um, it is a device or system that we came out with a few years back. Uh, when you purchase this on a new machine, it's also adaptable to old machines. The first two years, the subscription is included. Uh, after that, there is an annual subscription fee. Go on to the next slide. Um, this is, um, it, it provides you basically a window into the operation of the machine. And this is available on either an Android or an Apple phone. Um, it's also available on tablets through an app that is free to get, or you can get it um, with a computer. Uh, and access it. And what it's giving you is uh, a lot of data. It's going to tell you how many amp hours that you consumed on an electric machine. It's going to tell you how much fuel you consumed. Um, on electric, it's going to give you battery temperature. It's going to give you how many gallons of water that you used. It's going to tell you how much time that you spent out on the ice surface. It's going to tell you how fast your operator was going. Um, some we've had a couple of comments where people have said, well, it's a little big brotherish. And really, that's not what it's about. What it is, is it's about being able to get information from the machine, try to predict if you start seeing certain things on, say, a fuel powered machine that might be leading to bigger problems. It's also interactive in that uh, customers can take and um, record information it so they can record when they changed a blade, when they greased the machine. Uh, you're able to have access to it from outside the rink. Uh, I used an analogy of when I was a kid, my dad worked for the Minnesota North Stars and he would have to go in on a game day in the morning and then he'd come home, get a nap in, and then have to leave in the afternoon and he would be gone uh, until after the game was over. Well, part of what he had to do in the morning was to go in and, and see how the refrigeration plant was working. With 
this, if you were to have this type of system, I probably would have seen them a little bit more when I was growing up. But um, a lot of companies are going this direction. A lot of controls for refrigeration systems uh, have this type so that service personnel can access the information as to how things are running from offsite. And what, what that means for a manager is they could be um, on their vacation and if they wanted to pull up how the machine was performing and how it was being operated, they would be able to access this information and um, be able to utilize that if they had a problem with the machine. Uh, the accessibility of somebody, let's say you've got public works that takes care of your equipment, they're able to pull it up and see how many hours so that if they need to do something based on 100 hour intervals, that that's when they're coming in to do service, they're going to be able to see where they're at, maybe schedule based on how many days it's taken to get between 50 or 100 to 200 hours and better be able to prepare and react to things than uh, if they were just waiting for somebody to give them a phone call. Um, we're going to go on to the blade changing assistant. And what this is here is this makes it safer and easier for operators to change the blade. Um, I used to sharpen these blades 100 years ago when I was young and living in Minnesota. And I can tell you that they're very sharp, whether they're dull or whether they're um, freshly sharpened. And with the blade changing assistant, it makes the process of changing the blade easier can be done with one or two people. It's shown with two people here. What this shows in this picture is there's two red handled clamps, makes it easy to pick up the blade either out of the scabbard or um, off the bed of the blade, ch blade changing device. You can kind of see the little hex studs that are on top of the bed of the um, blade changing device. And that's where the bolts go. And the blade is then lifted up uh, on top of the bolts, put in or onto the bed of the blade changing assistant, and it slides in uh, underneath the machine. Your hands never get near the edge of the blade. Um, it's easier for operation. And the th one of the things that I like best about this system is that it is when you go to take the blade off, it makes it easier because these studs, these hex studs that are there will locate themselves into the bolt, the bottom of the bolt. So you're not having to reach in underneath and then you'll be able to loosen up, take off the nut and the lock washer and then set the device down onto the ground and wheel it back out, take the blade off and put it um, into the scabbard and put the fresh blade on and start the process again. It, this saves a lot of wear and tear on knees and backs. It keeps you from crawling around in water. Uh, it helps you reduce the chance that you're gonna drop a bolt um, or a nut and lock washer and have to reach in underneath the machine and put your arm at risk if you're doing that. Um, while we're on that topic, if any ever you drop a, a hardware, don't ever reach in underneath with your arm, get a hockey stick, get a broom handle, a shovel, get something to pull it back. Because if you hit that blade, you're not gonna notice that you've cut yourself until you feel the warm blood dripping from your arm. Go on to the next slide. This um, shows the, the process where the clamps are lifting the blade up. You can see the bolts in place. Um, this device uh, has got one tall side to go over what the chain guard, which we call the tombstone. Um, it, uh, it's got a short side to go on the conditioner, um, just makes it easy. And you can see in the middle picture on the top, um, how this just rolls underneath the machine with the bolts in place. It's lifted up. You don't have to worry about holding on to the bolts, lock washer, nut, go on top, hand tighten, drop the device down and then um, tighten it back down with the picture uh, as depicted on the left there. One of the things that I uh, want to touch base on here for people is the importance of the um, down pressure springs and the bolts and bushings in the lift bar. Uh, you'll notice the top left picture, uh, it's adjusting the um, set bolt for the down pressure spring. That's something that should be checked on a monthly basis. There's a jam nut there that gets loosened up. You back off the bolt hand tighten it and then give it one and a half to two turns. 
make sure whatever you do, whether it's one and a half turns or two turns, that you do it the same on both sides. Um, this at one point in time was a patented system uh, by Frank Zamboni, and we feel it's what sets us apart from our competition and that we're providing spring-loaded down pressure force to force the blade into the ice surface. These springs, when they're brand new, if you were to take them and set them on a very flat surface, there'd be about three quarters of an inch of gap between the surface and the bottom leaf of that spring. If that spring has flattened out or if they're broken, um, there's a leaf missing, it's time to replace that. Those springs aren't that expensive and it's a critical component in um, providing the capability for the best shaving possible with the machine. If you take a look at that bottom picture, you'll see a bolt um, and nut going through and then there's a bushing inside there. We sell a bolt and bushing repair kit and it's something that you should probably be taking a look at depending on how many hours that you put on your machine. That's something that should be done maybe every three or four years. Um, if you're a really busy facility, you might need to do it every couple of years. Any place where there is slop and wear, just the wear of the machine being operated in those bolts and bushings leads to play, which leads to reduced down pressure. So it's important that you take a look at those um, bolts and bushings um, on an annual basis and replace them as necessary. We went two years ago to a hardened bushing inside that lift bar um, to protect the lift bar itself because it is an expensive component where the bolts and bushings are less expensive. Those uh, bolt or those spring tension bushings are replaceable. It requires a little bit of work to knock them out and then you need to have a punch um, and be able to peen the edge over so that the new hardened bushing stays in place. But if you stay on top of um, greasing the machine, which is a, a big part of the maintenance of the machine. Uh, if you stay on top of greasing those bolts on a regular basis and that stuff that should be greased once a week, that will help reduce the potential wear for those bolts and bushings and give you extended life. Over on the right-hand side, you can see this picture that is showing um, the blade and the angle. And what's important um, for us is that um, we, get the blade sharpened at 24 to 25 degrees. I'm sorry, 24 to 26, 25 is the magic number. And if it's um, above that or below that, that leads to some problems with the 10 degree angle that we recommend that the blade be positioned at. If you have a level ice system, it's really critical that the blade be sharpened properly. Um, we found when we had a customer having some problems that the number one problem that was causing the issues for them was that that blade, the angle, if you take a look at it, the right, what we're talking about is where those arrows are, um, that it was not being sharpened to the 24 uh, to 26 degree. So 25 plus or minus one degree. And that throws off what then the blade needs to be set at. And on your machine, when you get a new machine, you'll get a blade angle gauge plate, which will be mounted on the left-hand side on the inside of the conditioner. We also send a blade angle tool uh, inside each toolbox. And that's something that um, by utilizing that tool, that can tell you um, whether you've got the blade set at 10 degrees or not. We can go on to the next slide. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, safety. And it's something that is very important to us. Um, we don't ever like to hear about uh, customers being injured um, on our machines or operating our machines. Uh, it's important that your operators or anybody who services uh, the machine has the proper equipment. I'm not gonna go so much to say that they need to have um, a hard hat or helmet, but there are some places that require um, operators to wear a helmet if they're out on the ice surface, whether they're walking or whether they're driving. <clears throat> I'm a big proponent of safety glasses. Um, when you're working on a machine, eyes don't grow back. Um, I am a fan of uh, ridiculousness with Rob Deerdick and they just had an episode where a guy was grinding outside and it let loose and the grinder hit him in the face and fortunately didn't lose his eyes. But 
um, it just takes a moment that you can have uh, damage um, that is not going to be able to be repaired. Um, the right hand side of this poster is, uh, or the right of the photo is a poster that is available. I believe that that can be downloaded. It's also something that you get with a new machine. We're also happy to send you out one if you need them. If you have multiple resurfacer bays or rooms, um, please make sure that you've got one of these uh, on prominently on display. A lot of times they go into facility and they'll have it on the door, um, on the inside of the door, so that's very visible. If it gets torn, tattered, you need a new one. We don't give away too many things, but uh, this is one we're happy to send out to people. It just talks about the potential hazards of operating our machine. Um, safety labels that uh, are shown there. We've gone to a new one um, in the world that we live in. We have to have labels that uh, are mostly photos. Um, they, if they have text, it's gotta be in the text and the language that the machine's going for to meet uh, certain standards. So, um, it's something with uh, also with safety mailings. We used to do safety mailings and those now are available online in the owner's area. We'll go to this next slide. This is, I'm having a little technical difficulty. These should be more of a pause page, but if you go to our website, um, you'll be able to uh, learn a lot about your machine all the manuals, operating instructions, and um, safety information is there. Old machines, new machines, um, all of it can easily be had there. We also have videos that are available. And if you have any suggestions for us um, with regards to videos, we're happy to, um, to, take, uh, uh, to take your advice and uh, see if it's something that we can create a, video for. So always open suggestions. We don't say that we know everything there is to know. Um, if it's constructive criticism, we're happy to hear it. If you've got a suggestion, what works, we have to weigh it, not just on one machine, but on um, three or 400 machines a year that we produce. Uh, so if we don't make the change, it's not that we don't feel that it might not be a good change. It's just that we have to take a look at costs versus benefits. So we're going to go on to the last slide, and I'm going to end my dialogue here. I want to thank you for um, being a part of the ISI. I want to thank you for listening to me go on uh, and on, and I'd like to open up the floor to any questions that you might have, and I will try to answer them for you. And if I can't, I will get somebody who can. Oh, I do. I found one. Okay. Amy Blum asks, we are a seasonal rink. Would mm -hmm. there be would there be issues for the lithium battery storing for months without use? No, and, and it's something that what is recommended for operation with the lithium ion is to leave it plugged into the charger and the charger is powered up and the charger will cycle on and off as it's needed. Um, if you're a season, depending on how much you operate, it may not provide you the benefits that um, that a fuel powered machine might be easier to deal with depending on your situation. But uh, it's, it's something even now with the um, new chargers on a lead acid, we recommend to people that they leave the charger plugged in whenever the machine is down for the season if they're not operational for a few months. If you're gonna be up for like four months of the year and then down for eight months, it might be something where every couple of months you come in and turn the machine on let it run for a little bit and then um, plug it back in and let it sit for another month or two. Good question. Anyone else with questions? Hey, Doug, do you know, um, I'm gonna ask you a question. Do you know how many of your machines are wrapped like in sponsorship out of your, out of your total machines? I don't have a percentage, but it is something that we've got a company out here in Anaheim that I recommend to people. We don't get compensated by them for promoting them. I just know that they do a great job and they 
um, can have the machine done, ready to go when it arrives to the customer. And they just did, I don't know, we've done a fair bit of promoting it. Um, I was able to go up to the facility in Santa Rosa, um, Snoopy's Home Ice. For me, it was, um, th there's only been a few places where I've gotten really juiced up about visiting ice rinks. This one was one of them because it's a cross between Disneyland and uh, Tomorrowland. And it's just uh, an unbelievable facility. If you ever get the opportunity to go visit, um, partake in the senior tournament that's up there, uh, attend a skating event. It is an unbelievable facility. And the only thing that I do or I'm doing is kicking myself for not getting up there when Mr. Schultz was still alive because he would go into the rink every day and it was his happy place. And it's, it's the most unique ice rink I've ever been in in my life. They got a brand new machine earlier this year. They had it wrapped um, by a company, this company down here in Anaheim and did a great job. It is an uh, avenue for people to uh, generate some revenue that they might not be thinking about. Um, it's something that in a NHL building, they're probably getting 50 to $100,000 a year per machine. Um, you're probably not going to get that in a community rink, but in a community rink, if you, let's say you got um, $5,000 and that might be a question, uh, Liz, a poll question um, for the membership to find out, you know, are you wrapping your machine? If so, how much are you getting? And uh, if people have that, they might want to share it with the office or share it through one of the ISI um, pages, Facebook pages, but um, it is a, um, it, it's a tool that people are looking at the ability to put it on is the challenge. It's not the hard part to design it. It's getting somebody that knows what they're doing, putting it on. And we do have on our website, we do have um, the dimensional drawings that uh, are done up by a company that does this so that it can tell you how much space is available and how, um, you know, where things need to be to, to put it on there. That's awesome. It's great. Yeah. I see a lot of your, um, the wraps on Instagram and whatnot, which is great. Um, for all of our attendees, I did put Doug's um, email in the chat, so he would be happy to entertain any questions that you have. If you don't feel like you want to ask him in an open forum, feel free to give him a shout. Um, if there aren't any other questions, are there any other questions, we will close it up for the day. Anyone else? I don't feel like I see any, so I'm going to say thank you, Doug Peters, for this thank you webinar. Um, appreciate everyone attending. And again, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to Doug um, personally or let us know here at the office and we'll connect you as well too. We hope everybody has a fantastic rest of their day and rest of their August. And thanks everyone for attending.